Next session now, so welcome back. Part two of the seminar is e-government, citizenship, participation, rights and responsibilities. Our first speaker is Margaret Allen. Margaret is the CEO and State Librarian of Western Australia. Her career has spanned public, special and state libraries, as well as some time working in the IT industry. She's a member of the International Federation of Library Associations Governing Board, an inaugural, uh, that's IFLA, IFLA, uh, an inaugural IFLA Leaders Associate, member of the IFLA or IFLA, I'm not sure, IFLA, <laughs> a member of the IFLA e-lending working group, chair of the Australian Library's Copyright Committee, board member of the Australian Digital Alliance, past president of the Australian Library and Information Association and ALIA, and a member of the ALIA Book Industry and e-lending advisory group. We're very lucky to have her here with all those responsibilities. Margaret, welcome. Please, please give her a hand. Thanks for that welcome and uh, it's great to be at the National Library. And since today seems to be a forum for um, uh, sharing family history secrets discovered on Trove, I thought I would start with my own. And look, my father's been gone many, many years. I was quite young when he died. So um, it's hard to underestimate the importance of something like Trove in trying to understand a little more about your family. So I'll just give you some dates and some things that I have found and it just makes, a, for me, an interesting story. So, um, and I grew up in Adelaide, I'm, I'm from Adelaide. So the first reference I can find of my father was in 1924 when he registered a motorbike. Those things were reported in the paper in those days. Then he pops up again in 1925, speeding on King William Street <laughs> on, <laughs> at 8.45 at 8 in the morning, clearly heading to work on said motorbike. <laughs> then again in 1927 on said motorbike. It wasn't King William Street, it was another street. But then, a bit of a gap, 1938, he was awarded a certificate of 12 months, um, in recognition of 12 months free of bad and bad driving um, <laughs> and accident free by the Royal Automobile um, Association, uh, by the Governor, and it was a certificate from the Governor. So you think, well, OK, something's happened between his speeding offences. And so that happened also in 1940 and 1941. So, you know, something like Trove, in terms of enabling um, me to be able to understand that about my father and never having had the opportunity to talk to him about that, and for my own kids, who have never <coughs> met their grandfather, you know, it's just something that they can take forward. And so, um, you know, and, and that's, that's about, for me, full citizenship in a digital environment. You know, I would never have sat down and gone through the microfilm of the advertiser um, to try and... It's just impossible to try and find my father's name. So we were to, we've been talking about Trove and how wonderful Trove is, but I think to so many people in Australia, it has a different personal... Uh, meaning around something they do. And that's just a, I thought, you know, everyone's sharing their family secrets on Trove. There's one for me. So I wanted to thank, uh, thank Sue, uh, Alex and Colin for actually setting the context of much of what I'm going to cover today. I think that they laid the background. And there's so much that I could cover in this space, but I don't really have the time. And Alex reflected on the formation of FAFI and um, CLM under IFLA, and they are areas that I'm very much involved in, and the whole issue of copyright in the digital environment and what that actually means in terms of um, access. Um, many of you would not even know, but something that we take for granted in the digital environment, but simply forwarding an email, you may be breaking the Copyright Act. Now, we would think in this digital world that actually, you know, everyone forwards, it, forwards an email, and we all do, but the fact that it could contain copyright covered matter, you know, publications or information, and by forwarding it, you're actually retransmitting it under the Act, you're actually breaking copyright. So those things are really, really important in the digital environment. I'm not going to go into that today, but it just, I think, illustrates how complex uh, and broad this whole issue of digital citizenship 
is and how, how difficult some of the issues are. And as we've noted, it's a somewhat new concept. I think we're probably all grappling with exactly what it means. But I think um, libraries occupy a really interesting space when we look at e-government digital citizenship, the digital world and how the community engages. And Colin earlier mentioned um, that digital citizenship was fundamentally about trust. And he used words like reliability and openness and responsiveness. And I think they describe libraries beautifully. Um, we have been since, you know, for centuries a trusted profession. Um, and libraries are in a, a unique position. We are particularly public libraries or libraries that are accessible to the public. Um, we're in a really unique position. We are open, we are trusted, we, we are responsive. Um, they're really uh, important characteristics that we have that really um, helps in that whole uh, trust environment around digital citizenship. Libraries have always been early adopters of technology and um, as Louise mentioned, uh, my first job out of library school was actually to develop a new library management system. Um, I'm showing my age, but we, we, we were one, libraries were one of the first places, I think, where people actually were able to engage with technology. And in the early 1980s, we had an online public access catalogue. So we had a terminal <coughs> that provided a digital access to our collections. And this was about 1981, so it was fairly, fairly leading edge at that stage. But if you think about it and you know, reflecting back, how many places did you see digital technology in a public space that anyone could go up and, and play with? So libraries have been very long adopters, facilitating access to technology and enabling people to use technology. So we've been doing it for a long time. And in our current world, um, mobile technology um, is removing a lot of barriers and um, there are places in the world that are completely skipping the desktop. So in Africa, there's a big leap to personal mobile devices, particularly the mobile phone. Uh, and we're seeing that in remote indigenous communities as well. They're actually bypassing some of the intermediate steps. So here I'd like to just talk a little bit about a project that we're doing at the State Library. It's called um, Storylines. And in that project, we're helping, we think, in the uh, digital literacy, digital citizenship space, as well as enabling uh, Aboriginal people to reconnect, reconnect with their community memory and culture. So most library systems are not bilingual. Um, you know, most of what we deal with is in English. Um, and that's particularly challenging in uh, Aboriginal communities where often three or four languages are spoken and English is usually not the first language. It's often the third or fourth language despite it being the official gov language of government and education. And so when we present information in that world, we're always presenting it in English. That's what we tend to do. So under Storylines, we're actually encouraging um, Aboriginal people to engage with their collections. And particularly we start with material that we hold in our collection about Aboriginal people. Most of it's from a white man's perspective. It's been taken by, um, uh, um, you know, sociologists and people that have been working in communities, but it's all from a, um, a, a white man's perspective. So under Storylines, we're actually digitally repatriating some of our collections back into communities. And we have a couple of pilot projects up in the Broome Derby area in a couple of communities where we've installed the Storylines database, populated it with material that we have in our collections and returned it back to the community. So it's supported by a software system um, which is based on um, objects, places, people, stories, plants, animals, um, and allows, or and, and indigenous technology, um, and it allows those pictures, those objects to be tagged and linked within the system to create vast knowledge profiles which reflect the many languages, stories and perspectives of Aboriginal Western Australia. So in a community, it's about that community um, taking those objects, adding their local knowledge and building up uh, a database of stories, information that can be passed and shared with uh, other generations. 
For us, uh, storylines, we believe, will become a central point for Aboriginal people who wish to access the State Library of Western Australia's extensive heritage collections and a safe place to store records of people, place and history. And we can identify material that's sensitive or sacred and treat it appropriately. So we've been working with these communities in setting up this system. We commissioned an evaluation um, by Dr Inga Kral and interestingly, one of the findings um, out of that evaluation was that many of the people that were using the database, and this is particularly in one of the communities, um, was going straight to digital literacy without actually going through the normal path of developing their English language and literacy skills. So what we had done in... Um, what we thought was simply a way to return unique knowledge back to the community has actually enabled them to engage in um, whole digital life. So they've learnt basic skills, obviously, around how to use a computer, how to uh, tag, tag records, how to add information and to be able to share it. So in Western Australia, where we have extreme... Um, distances, uh, big challenges around reliable internet access, no public libraries in those areas. Storylines provides, um, goes part way to providing the sorts of standard, those sorts of services and support that a public library does. Other areas where we've particularly looking at um, traditional knowledge and uh, working with Aboriginal people is the Noongarpedia project in Western Australia. So this is a joint project, um, Curtin University project, um, but State Library staff are particularly actively involved. And essentially it's using Wikipedia to establish a Noongarpedia, Noongar being um, the local uh, Aboriginal people in the southwest of Western Australia. Um, and there we're using, you know, we're encouraging in the same way that Wikipedia does volunteers to actually create and add that information. But that enables those people to be full participants in the digital world, to exercise their digital citizenship by giving them the skills. So there's certainly challenges for government and institutions such as the State Library to recognise the authority and importance of local knowledge holders and to help them to fully participate as digital citizens. I think one of the other areas where certainly State Library of Western Australia and colleagues in other um, state and national libraries contribute is really around uh, collecting the record of government, the published record of government, and making it accessible. And I know, you know, that obviously um, there's various legislative frameworks that um, ensure that government information is kept and stored, but what state libraries and National Library are very good at doing is actually making that available back to the community. And I ponder my own experience a couple of years ago when I was on the Book Industry Collaborative Council. I was the earlier nominee to that council. Now, the Book Industry Collaborative Council has quite a long history, but it was established by Greg Combay under the first Rudd government. And there were it was significant government investment in making, bringing the book industry together to try and progress a number of issues. So we worked for a year, we were formed for a year, we were brought to Canberra, we met, we had working groups, we were, you know, put together a very significant report. But it so happened that basically the week that report was due to be released was the change of the leadership between... Um, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, it was commissioned by Combe under Rudd. Then there was the change from Gillard to Kim Carr as industry minister. This was an industry portfolio-led initiative, not, a, not an arts portfolio. But the week, basically, the report was due to be publicly released... The election was called. So a whole year's work and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of government investment, which was tied up in this report, effectively got buried. The department couldn't release it publicly because um, Parliament was in, um, you know, Parliament had been prorogued and we were heading into an election. So how were we going to get this work out? The department couldn't release it Minister couldn't release it officially, being a minister. So Kim Carr did release it as 
um, the member for whatever he is, and I can't remember what that is, but he released it on his website. So that was great, but of course Labor lost the election. The whole thing disappeared within a very, very short amount of time. So if you look at government accountability, um, the ability, digital citizenship in, term of, in terms of being able to engage in this report, which was only online, no printed output, you know, what happens? Luckily, we managed to grab a copy of the report and colleagues here at the National Library agreed to um, preserve it. So it's a really important role if you look at citizenship and the concept of being able to engage <coughs> properly in democracy. Um, the role of national library and state libraries in collecting and preserving and then making available that record is vitally, vitally important in, in any democracy. And that's obviously our legal deposit responsibilities, but there is a whole debate now, at least within my organisation, around whether our legal deposit, how far our legal deposit responsibilities um, stretch about data. Is a publicly available data set a published record? And should we collect it? And then, you know, what are the implications for the library in collecting data sets? And we don't just collect, we're also about skilling and enabling people to access that. So what does that mean for us in terms of giving people the skills, and Sue mentioned ANS, but giving people the skills, the general public, to actually be able to access and use data. So there's quite a few challenges there. And then, of course, we've talked this morning about the e-safety uh, initiatives, and libraries have a really important role in, in, in helping people to work safely online. But I'd like to finish particularly with reference to public libraries and uh, my colleagues in public libraries. And Sue's covered some of this, but it's a network of some 1,500 public libraries in Australia, and they are literally everywhere from the terminals out the back of the kitchen in the Territory to your beautiful modern, you know, and we've just opened a beautiful library in, city, in Perth, you know, that modern, fabulous public library. They come in all shapes and sizes. But the thing that they have in common, and Sue mentioned that there was 97% of public libraries have terminals, most public libraries in Australia provide access to technology, to support to, uh, for people trying to use technology skill people in using that technology, helping them to make sure they do it in a safe way. And right across government, and we talk about government, but actually there's you know, layers of government and the federation's a complex uh, beast. But government at all three levels are pushing their services online. So you can almost not engage with Centrelink at all unless you have access in the digital world. Yet, as Sue mentioned, um, they're some of the most uh, deprived in terms of access to technology, having the right skills. So government policy, and, and often it's very easy, and I know I'm a, you know, I'm a bureaucrat, I, looking for efficiencies, yes, let's put it online. But what we actually don't think about is the implications further down the line. We'll just push this stuff online. But how many, how many programs, how many government programs where we put a service online actually include any component for skilling people around how to use it or providing access to the technology? It's just assumed that someone else uh, will do that. And that's what's happening. And that's where these people end up at public libraries. And public libraries stand up and they are in there and they're supporting people and they're helping people. And that's a really vital role in terms of engagement with digital citizenship. So I think I'm almost out of time. Um, the only other, I guess the other thing, oh, sorry, another example. In fact, we were talking about this at, drinks last night, someone said, and, and Sue mentioned this, um, people with disabilities, again, are one of the, the um, least well provisioned in terms of access to the technology. Um, but the NDIS, which of course is a huge government policy initiative, apparently, um, you know, in which you, as an NDIS, NDIS participant, you have the ability to pick from essentially a menu of services that you might think are suitable and that you want to access. But as I understand it, most of that is online. You do that online. 
yet again, you've got, you've got a, a flagship government policy initiative, but you've got people with almost the least ability to access that technology. So there, there, there is a mismatch, and I think there are challenges for all of us in this room as uh, policy makers and, and program deliverers to actually make sure that we can raise these issues and strengthen those mechanisms that we already have uh, in terms of enabling citizens to fully participate in the services that government provides and in the democratic process. And I would argue that public libraries are actually one of the key uh, mechanisms by which we can ensure and strengthen digital citizenship in Australia. Thank you. Thanks very much, Margaret. It's interesting to hear about the achievements but the challenges that that we all still face. And uh, I think it's really interesting too, especially as someone who lives here in Canberra, the you know national capital, the political centre, to hear, um, given all the speculation at the moment about a possible double dissolution and expecting an election anyway sometime later this year, to hear about the work that goes on behind the scenes that can be so disrupted when um, we do the democratic thing and have an election. So thank you.